Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the uh, 25th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Uh, can I uh, welcome members, uh, welcome our witnesses, and welcome guests in the gallery. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off, or at least turn to silent, all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound <coughs> equipment. We have apologies this morning from uh, the Deputy Convener, Dennis Robertson, and from Joan McAlpin. Uh, item one on the agenda, uh, can I ask if members are content that we take item three in private? Yes. That's agreed, thank you. Item two on the agenda, we are taking evidence this morning from the Scottish Government's Council for uh, Economic Advisors, and I'd like to uh, welcome from the Council, Crawford Beveridge, who's the Chair, uh, Professor Sarah Carter, uh, Jim McCall, and Professor Anton Muscatelli. And welcome to you all, and thank you for giving up your time to come along. Um, I think we've got about uh, an hour, maybe just a little bit longer uh, for the session this morning, and we're interested in hearing uh, on, a, on a range of issues uh, to do with the Scottish Government's uh, economic strategy, the national performance framework, uh, issues around uh, internationalization, manufacturing, Scotland's tax regime, the Fiscal Commission, uh, and the current state of the uh, economy and uh, the government's agencies. So I'm sure we'll rattle through that in no time at all. Um, and um, given there, there, there's four of you, I mean, please don't feel you all have to chip in and answer every question. So we'll, we'll let you decide amongst yourselves uh, how you want to handle the questions. Um, and uh, if you want to, to agree or perhaps more entertainingly for us disagree with each other, please feel free to do that. But before we get into questions, Mr. Beveridge, do you want to say something by way of an uh, introduction? Uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, Convener, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity for all of us to uh, come and speak to you today. Um, I last appeared at this committee, I think, in 2012 in my capacity then as the chair of the council, as it was formulated at that time, uh, to give evidence on the role and work of the council. And uh, myself and several of the other members have uh, been here on different aspects of policy uh, several times since then. Uh, the role of the Council, I'd, I'd uh, just remind you, is to be an independent advisory body to the First Minister. Uh, mainly, we are a sounding board for uh, ideas, act as a critical friend to the, to the government, and put forward suggestions that we think might make a difference uh, in areas that the First Minister has invited us to consider. Um, following the publication of the government's uh, programme for government last year, the Council remit was uh, refreshed. Whereas previously we had been tasked with advising the then First Minister on issues such as recovery and jobs and economic levers and internationalization, our remit now is somewhat wider and we've been asked to advise on actions to improve the competitiveness of the Scottish economy and actions to, to tackle inequality. Uh, alongside this, as you'd expect, the Council membership was also refreshed. Um, and as you'd expect, there's been both continuity and change in this. So the First Minister asked several previous members to continue to serve on the Council, some of whom you've seen before, uh, Joe Stiglitz from the US, uh, Jim McCall, who's here today, uh, Sir James Murleys, uh, Francis Ruane, uh, and myself. Um, and they've been, uh, they've, they have stayed on the committee, and then the First Minister also invited several new members to join the Council. And we were joined by uh, Sir Harry Burns, whom most of you will know, formerly the government's chief medical officer, uh, uh, Sarah Carter from Strathclyde, uh, and Professor uh, Mariana Mazzucato of the University of Sussex. Uh, Amanda McMillan, whom you might know as the, the uh, Managing Director of Glasgow Airports, and Professor Anton Muscatelli, who's here with us today uh, also. It's pretty early in the life of this council, I warn you, to tell, tell you very much about what we're going to achieve. We had the very first meeting here uh, just last March, and we're trying to aim at two formal meetings of the whole group a year. And then we have several in-between times by telephone, uh, either one-on-one -on -one with some of the officials or as a group where we've had a couple of different uh, uh, teleconferences. Um, and I'm also keen that we continue to engage uh, with others who are involved in improving the performance of the economy, and we look for opportunities to do that. For instance, uh, since one of the issues that we were tasked uh, to look at by the First Minister was this area of innovation, uh, as you may know, the Deputy First Minister already chairs an uh, innovation forum called the Can Do Innovation Forum. So uh, yesterday, in my capacity as chair, I went as an observer to that meeting to make sure that we were aligned, and we've now got the officials who serve as both groups uh, aligned with each other so that we don't, uh, we don't run into each other all over the place. So in the first meeting in March of the year, the, fir the First Minister asked us to focus our work uh, on some specific areas within the broad remit, 
and these include inclusive growth and innovation, as well as around the measurement of the economic strategy and its ambitions through the National Performance Framework. And these are the areas are, that will form the bulk of what we'll be considering in the course of the next two days while we're meeting together uh, here in, in Edinburgh. Um, and that's probably enough background for now, I think, Convener, if you will be happy to take it on questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you, yeah, you, you may have arguments yet. after all. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, can I, can I remind members as we go into questions, if we can keep questions as short and to the point as possible and, and responses as short and to the point, because uh, there's quite a, a number of topics I think we're, we're keen to cover. C can I just start off by just picking up the point you made, made about the... Um, the Scottish Government's economic strategy, which was la launched earlier this year. W was that something that you were involved in, 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 in drafting or were you consulted on the content of that? So the, the current council that was not particularly involved because right. we were only forming you know, in, uh, in October, November, December of mm -hmm. last year. Um, but a lot of the work that was in that strategy came from some of the prior work of the council. You know, you can't you, you can't draw a direct line to all of it, but I mean, there's a, there were a lot of the issues that went in there that we had already been discussing in the prior council. So, uh, things around innovation, things around uh, inequality, we, they'd all been getting a reasonable amount of discussion beforehand. Okay, because w one of the aspects I think is interesting in the, in, the, in the new economic strategy that's quite a departure from the previous one was. Um, the, the previous commitment about cutting corporation tax has, has, now, has now gone. Was that something you suggested, or, or do you know where that came from? We had, we had had a discussion in the prior council. As you know, the prior council had a, a, a fiscal commission subcommittee in, the, in there, um, or at least I think you know that, that was made up mainly of the economists, but that which I, I chaired. And we had spent some time talking uh, about that, and when we visited the finance committee, Andrew Hughes, Hallett, and I, we're trying to give people uh, an understanding that you know there are various ways to look at corporation tax, which were you know you couldn't just look at the actual rate; you had to look at where all the where allowances happened and how much actual take there was. And we had some examples to show different countries where the rates looked very low, but the take was actually quite high, and vice versa. And so we had had some discussion around uh, you know could you tailor this in some way uh, towards activities that you might want to encourage, such as R and D, for example. Um, and, uh, but we'd never actually gone, in. I, would, I would be too strong to say we made a proposal, but we'd had these debates inside the, inside the council. And, and you think, so you think that was reflected in, in the new economic strategy? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe I, I could ask Jim McCall this question, because I know, you, Mr. McCall, you're quite an evangelist for cutting corporation tax. I mean, what was... It, it wasn't so much about cutting, it was having control of it. Right. Um, because then you can have specific um, initiatives targeted at, sec at certain sectors, you know, industrial sectors. We see it in other countries and we're involved in, where the headline might be the same, but you would have some flexibility, you know, to encourage or uh, stimulate um, certain industries or certain activities within, uh, within companies. And, and the allowances against it, you know, if you look at um, R&D, I mean, the way R&D is handled just now is, is very inefficient and, and companies don't really, um, don't really uh, I, I think, engage in it the way they should. If I compare it with one of our businesses in Canada, um, in Canada, the, if you do R&D, it gets put through your accounts and the auditors are charged with checking that it does meet the rules um, you know, to, to qualify for, for R&D allowance, and then it gets deducted from whatever, you know, your, your, your uh, taxes. It gets deducted so that your, your corporation tax is based on the net number. Um, now, we, we seem to have a, a very complicated system in the UK where it's handled by uh, the tax authorities and you don't get it back. And I, I know I've given an example before that um, we did claim for some R&D uh, had it refused, employed PwC to appeal, won the appeal, and it cost us more to pay PwC than we got in the... But, but we did it out of principle. Uh, we haven't tried to claim any since because I just think it's too complicated. And, and that's an area where if you have control of corporation tax, then you can, um, you know, you can play about the way you handle things more efficiently. OK, thanks. So it's control of yeah. it rather than... Okay you know, the absolute rate. Right, okay. I think Lewis McDonald wants to come in with a follow-up on, on this point. I, I guess a couple of things just to understand what this shift means in terms of the government's economic strategy and also 
your view as a Council of Economic Advisers on that. The Scottish Government has said now, which it didn't say um, when Alex Hammond was First Minister, that there's no, there's no intention to have a race to the bottom. Those words are explicit. And, and also that, that the previous emphasis on corporation tax cut has been replaced by a proposition for targeted tax changes. What's your understanding of what is meant in the economic strategy by targeted tax changes? I suspect is, is, is what I've just said, that you have the ability to, um, you know, to, to vary the rate. So I, I think there would still, um, I, I'm just surmising this, I would think that the government would still want to have control of it, of it but would not necessarily want to reduce the headline rate of it. But, but have the flexibility to be more targeted. So, so we should understand it as still being a proposition around corporation tax exclusively? Well, as an advisor to the government, that's what I would be saying. At the, the, on and the that's, your, that's what they're saying to you when you discuss these matters with Well, I, they haven't specifically said that to us. Yes, we, we, haven't, we haven't. So far in this council, we have not discussed the issue of corporation tax at all. We had discussed it, as I was saying earlier, in, in principle in the prior councils and just said there are options to do this. And it, but it is, as, uh, as Jim rightly says, you know, it's an issue of if you have the control of it, you can then make some logical decisions about what you want to do with it. But your understanding, when, when, when the government talks about targeted tax changes to promote competitiveness and uh, reduce inequality, it's essentially around a, a more nuanced approach to cutting corporation tax. Do you want to come in? I mean, I would just echo what's been said. I think, and if you read, you know, the, the particular page of the of the government economic strategy, it's about it's exactly that. It's not about taking a blanket approach. It's looking at R and D, particularly. It's looking at uh, investment in capital, uh, and indeed encouraging growth of SME. So you can take a much more differentiated approach with if you have all those tools at, at your disposal. Um, and, you know, we've seen in other countries also the, the, the possibility that you could target employment. So there is a, you know, an attempt to try and, and which again would fit well with an inclusive growth mechanism where you could say, well, if you're creating employment uh, as part of that investment, there's, a, there's, there's a t an attempt to tie that together with corporation tax. So, um, and, and Jim has given a good example of where R&D tax uh, credits can work quite effectively and, and efficiently, actually more importantly. Okay, thanks. I mean, it just seems to me it's a more nuanced approach you're now suggesting rather than the previous approach was a kind of headline cut in, in three pence in corporation tax below the UK rate. So there's been a bit of a, a shift in, in that. Okay, um, I'll bring in um, Gordon McDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Um, you said that one of the, the, the issues you have been asked to tackle is inequality, and that obviously includes uh, income inequality. And that, that must be tied to growth and employment uh, and therefore connected with economic performance. And yesterday's um, figures for Scotland uh, were you know, pretty poor in comparison to the rest of the UK. Is there any underlying reason for that, that, that we know why we, we grew by 0.1% as opposed to UK's uh, quarterly growth of 0.7? I mean, like you, I saw the numbers only... Uh only this actually yesterday evening. I mean, Anton may have a little more clue to, to why this is, but at the moment, I personally don't have any idea about why the growth level was at, at point one. I mean, the total the total numbers are, are 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 lower than they were in the previous figure. On the other hand, it is I think the twenty first um, I think it's the twenty first quarter. I don't know the twelfth twelfth consecutive consecutive quarter of, of uh, continuous growth. I think. Uh, I think you can always expect these fluctuations depending on what, what's happening in the different sectors. And also the other thing to bear in mind is that these figures can be adjusted. I think one possible impact here, which might have depressed this particular quarter compared to the rest of the UK, might have been the onshore element of the oil and gas industry. Now, in fact, the, the UK's figures were bo boosted by increased production in oil and gas, but which is attributed to the UK as opposed to attributed to Scotland. So, you know, you need to dig below these figures to see what, what, what is actually happening. Um, one thing which was, uh, I gather, particularly strong in these figures, which helped at least maintain them uh, at that level, is, uh, is construction, which has been um, fueled by, by public investment. So, but I, I wouldn't put too much store on one quarter's figures. I mean, GDP growth does tend to fluctuate a bit. The, the key thing is the trend rate of growth, not, not what you would see in a single quarter. Yeah, that, that was very helpful. In, in, terms of, in terms of what you said about oil, can, can I just be clear about that? What you're saying is 
the growth in oil figures feed into the UK numbers but don't feed into the Scottish numbers. Is that what you said? If it's oil production, oil and gas production, yes, whilst obviously activity, economic activity which is onshore related to that in the Aberdeen area would, would add to, to, um, to the Scottish figures, but yes, absolutely. And you said about um, Scottish construction growing and it was tied to economic policy, but we were expecting to see uh, further cuts to Scotland's budget. So what impact do you think that will have on uh, the economic performance if we're so dependent on Scottish construction to hold our percentage up? Again, I wouldn't put too much store on, on, on one particular set of figures. Obviously, if, there is a, if, if there's going to be a cut, say, in, in, in capital spending in the public sector, then, and that feeds through to the Scottish Block Grant, then that would have an impact on, on, on growth. But, um, you know, you have, to, you have to look at the whole thing in, in, in the round and not just at, uh, at, uh, at, w at one particular quarter's figures. But clearly that would have a negative impact if, it was, if the next spending review at UK level led to a cut in, in, in public spending in, 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 on, on the capital side. And my other question I was going to ask about, you know, Scotland's a, an exporting country and we export mainly to the Eurozone and we've seen the strength of the pound to the Eurozone, it's about its highest levels it's been since about 2007. Um, given that the UK has a balance of trade deficit and Scotland has a balance of trade surplus, you know, the policy of having a strong sterling, what, what impact is that having on Scotland's exports? I mean, obviously that does create potentially competitiveness uh, issues, although you have to take into account that between 2000, 2007 and 2013, the, the value of, uh, of Scotland's non-oil and, and gas international exports has actually increased by about 40%. So, I mean, Scotland is, is keeping its own. Um, it's not just about the, the currency. It's also about the, having a competitive offering. And, and Jim could obviously talk about this given his knowledge of the industrial base in Scotland. But, I, I, but clearly... Um, what happens to sterling relative to the euro is going to be is going to be important. But let me add one other thing. Actually, demand for export uh, for us, a, a prosperous Europe, is actually more likely to to be a, a strong a strong pool on our export than simply just the currency. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, Louis McDonald wants to come in with a follow up. And then yeah, thanks very much. In fact, if it weren't for the growth in construction activity, the Scottish economy would have contracted between April and June. Is that your analysis as well? Well, it's, yes, arithmetically that's clearly, clearly yeah. the case. But again, just to stress, I mean, these, uh, the different sectoral elements do tend to go up and down, and, and one tends to offset the other. So you can't, you know, you can't just look at one, one quarter's figure and draw conclusions. You need to look at the trend. No, understood. The, 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 the one particular sector I'd be interested in your views on and, and the advice you're giving to government on is the oil and gas supply chain and, and service sector, particularly as it impacts on the North East, but clearly that impacts across Scotland. What, what is your own assessment from an economic uh, point of view of the scale of uh, uh, risk that faces the Scottish economy currently with reduced uh, activity arising from oil and gas? And just to stress, we haven't provided any particular advice on that sure. area at mm -hmm. the moment. I mean, I think one of the key things is, uh, is that you're seeing a lot of companies in that area diversifying. Um, we saw announcements around Wood Group, for instance, and, and, and similar companies. I think that's what's key. Um, I think what's important over time is that an expertise has been built in, in the northeast of Scotland around, around engineering, which can be used to, to diversify, not just base, base it on that. But again, just to stress, you know, uh, oil prices are incredibly volatile. I mean, we've seen a decline. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't personally put any personal bets on, on what's going to happen over the next couple of years in, in that area. So, but I think what, what the lesson of the last year or two has been is that diversification is hugely important, even within that sector. And I, I, you're, you're right to emphasize the importance of the expertise that's been built up, but I don't <laughs> think anyone in the sector itself expects prices to go up anytime soon. Um, and, and so I, I, I'm, I'm particularly keen to understand uh, how uh, the impact of uh, I mean, Oil and Gas UK, the industry body, has said something like 65,000 jobs lost already across the UK. 
um, half or more than half of those clearly in Scotland um, because of the uh, importance of oil and gas in the Scottish economy. That must presumably have an impact on demand for services across the economy and for manufacturing. And I wonder, one of the things I've been keen to see is some assessment of that carried out by government or by government's advisors. Have you had any conversations with government about the significance of this scale of job losses on the Scottish economy? We have, we have not had any discussion so far on this, but I, I, I stress, you know, the, the, we met for the first time in March and we're still just trying to build up, uh, you know, where we might be useful. So it may well happen, but we haven't to date. I mean, presumably Jim McCall, being a, a, a man with great uh, experience of the manufacturing sector, will recognise this, the scale of importance of this. And, and but, uh, in, you know, it, it has case. had quite a, a, a big um, a downturn in employment just now, but, you, you know, we've been looking recently at the underlying drivers there. Um, and in our own business, the North Sea is actually holding up quite well and the Middle East is holding up. The Gulf of Mexico is the hardest hit. Um, but it, the, reason, the reason this is all happening just now is we have an oversupply of oil. Demand is lower than supply. And we have an oversupply because the Americans did all this fracking and the Middle East are refusing. The, you, you, the OPEC countries are ramping up their, um, their output to keep their market share. Now, the, in, in the fracking, has, um, the fracking in, in uh, the US has turned down. The jack-up rigs in the Gulf of Mexico are down at 20% now. And uh, all the indications are that when we work through this, this oversupply just now and the surplus that we have, um, demand uh, is going to uh, overtake supply around 2017, maybe 2018. And the price is going to go back up again and activities are going to start again. So it, it is a huge shock in the, in the short term, uh, but um, it's still a viable, uh, a viable area, the North Sea. Um, the, the, the prices will go back up. It's more the short term impact than the wider yes. Scottish manufacturing yeah. supply chain I'm concerned with. I think you're reflecting that that is significant. <coughs> Chick Rooney. Thank you. Good morning. It's interesting that last point made by Jim, because if you look at the Brent crude projections for the next three years, and indeed the Economic Active Survey, it reflects exactly what you were saying in, in terms of uh, things like uh, seven rigs being closed in the Gulf of Mexico, for example. Anyway, the question I'd like to ask is about internationalisation. And I do so with some apprehension because I'm speaking in a debate tonight about how Scotland's ethical strategy on trade can open up uh, North Korea. <laughs> I hope I'm able to leave the debate. Um, but one of the things we've talked about is Scottish economic success it depends on us strengthening links with the global economy. Uh, and specifically, I'd like to ask Jim and, and Crawford with regard to manufacturing. We have been in this committee are looking at internationalisation of the Scottish brand and Scottish products. And while we focus very much on food and drink, one of the key areas is, is in my belief, is manufacturing. And we don't seem to be able to uh, deliver the, the increase in exports of manufactured goods and services that we uh, perhaps might have. And I, I heard Professor Muscatelli saying that the, the value of international exports has risen by 40%, but that's the cash value. In, in terms of percentage of, of output, it has remained fairly stable over the last few years. So I'm just wondering, uh, on the basis that a new trade and investment strategy is to be developed, what are the key uh, factors, key tenets that would encourage us to uh, secure a greater proportion of uh, investment, particularly in manufacturing? Start. Yeah. So um, I'll remind everybody that, we, by the way, how did you ever get to, into a debate that sounds that complicated in the first place? I mean, <laughs> but somebody says, I look Chinese, I don't know. <laughs> I'd remind us that, you know, most of our companies in Scotland are, are small and medium sized enterprises. And from my uh, erstwhile career in Scottish enterprise, uh, it was my experience that many of those were just very worried about exporting at all. They just didn't know how to do it. 
And for a long time, we had uh, really only provided them help into a couple of markets, into Europe and into, uh, and into North America. Uh, as the other parts of the world have expanded, my ex-colleagues have set up offices, as you know, in many of those places, and they're now working an account management system with a strong drive to try and help SMEs to understand how they can go about uh, going into places like China or South America or so on. And I think it just takes time for them to be able to get people convinced that to get out of their comfort zone of being able to just manufacture in Scotland and stay in Scotland and then figure out that they really could uh, tackle the wide world, that there are no huge legal problems if they just get some help in the right directions. You know, So I, I think it's a it's a really a matter of education here, and I think people are focused on trying to, to help with that exact problem. Jim? Yeah, well, I... I I would agree with what you say. You know, it was, it was companies um, really not knowing how to how to break into the markets. But I think one of the other issues, uh, and it, it's it's um, a serious one, is the um, financial support to these companies. You know, with what's happened to the banks, it's not easy for these companies to get debt finance. And more importantly, um, if you're selling overseas, very often you have to put up a, a bank guarantee. A, you know. A, the, that um, covers the cost of your your exports. Now, that's treated by the banks just now as um, core debt. If you're a small company, you might not be able to get it within your debt capacity. Um, now, the, you do have, through um, the UK, the export credit guarantee system. And, you know, we had a particular involvement in that when I was involved in the pumps business, where... I was on a trip with David Cameron to um, China, and I told them on, on the trip that it was, it was great that we're trying to drum up business for the UK, but it was a pity that we wouldn't be able to exploit it because when we get the orders, we wouldn't be able to raise the bonds to support it. Now, he, he did follow up with that and put in place through... Um, I got a call from uh, uh, Export Credit Guarantee to say that Number 10 had been on to them, giving them three months to get a trade support package in place. Now, it didn't, it, six months later it was in place, and we got it uh, for a pump order for China. But it's very difficult to get. You know, that was just to showcase that they had actually put it in place. It's not efficient, and smaller companies find it absolutely impossible. So um, I, I would think it would be much more uh, appropriate if the Scottish Government had control of something like that for Sc Scottish companies. Um, and also, for domestic jobs as well, you have to put it up. I'm seeing that just now in a business we're in. And um, Finvera in, in Finland, one of, one of the biggest companies we got in terms of money committed to it is in Finland. And the Finnish Government have a Finnish investment bank that can lend to uh, small companies, up to 250 employees, I think it is. They will lend to, they will put bonding in place for export jobs, but they will also put it in place for domestic jobs, and they will give them support. They work with banks, but they stand behind it and guarantee it. And when I was in the pump business, when I was explaining this to um, uh, the government uh, at the time we went to China, I could have. I had to move one job to France because um, the French government back 80%. They give 80% bank backing to uh, their, their industrial businesses. Another one to Canada, where it's 100% backed by a government guarantee. Now, these are contingent obligations. You don't have to give cash. You have to stand behind it. And I've never heard of one being called. But that's something that I think would make a significant difference to the, the opportunity of the people, the small companies being able to exploit the opportunities that are there overseas, and there are plenty of them. Okay. The, the, this question really is a follow-on, because it, we need new products and services to go to market, and the international aspect is very important. I wonder if I can ask Professor Carter and Professor Muscatelli. One of the conversations we had only two weeks ago uh, with... Uh, the universities regarding wages, work and well-being was the need for innovation and of course innovation is in partnerships at the heart of, of, of our exports which are critical to economic success. One of the things that was surprising was when we asked the question what involvement universities might take in, you know, for example at Stanford uh, you'll know 
the, the, the level of equity participation that universities take in, in new products and ensuring they get to market. We were told in Scotland that they, they would go and look at this. They hadn't looked at this. I mean, isn't there a need for you know, the research and development that, that, that we require, and a lot of that comes out of the universities, for a greater involvement and understanding of the uh, business and internationalisation of the products that are developed? Um, if I can answer that question from the perspective of SMEs, because, of course, much of the innovation that is take, undertaken in universities is exploited by either spin-outs or local companies. And many of Scotland's universities ex, um, give a huge amount of support to supporting the SME um, sector, whether the, if that's through innovation, whether it's through support for management, whether it's through... Uh, connecting small firms with, for example, funders, bankers, the corporate sector. As far as they're concerned, other than they give all that, and they do. But in terms of equity participation, involvement, you know, it seems to be lacking. Can I ask Anton Moscatelli to uh, respond to that one? Yeah, no, I mean, I think one of the things that certainly is scarcer not only, I think, in Scotland, but I think across Europe, compared to the US, is certainly the availability of, of, of venture capital in these uh, circumstances. Having said all that, um, there is an attempt to try and draw closer and ensure that there is co-investments by investment by universities and also companies. And I'll give you, I suppose, I'll, I'll give you two examples of that. Uh, recently, a US sort of venture capital organisation decided to establish a fund around investing in, in Scottish. Uh, life sciences, Epidarix, Capital. Three of the Scottish universities, including my own, put money into that. Some of that is now being invested back into a number of uh, businesses, not all our own. Uh, not, it's, it's not an exclusive fund in any way. It's investing across the whole of Scotland. And it's been, a, I think it's a, it's a good example of, of, of pump priming capital, which has now led some of these companies to actually grow, grow quite substantially. But I think if you look at other ways in which we need to feed the interface, and it comes back to the point which Crawford mentioned, which is uh, trying to join up the innovation uh, ecosystem in Scotland through the Can Do Forum. Uh, innovation, um, uh, innovation centres, which is something that uh, the, the public money has been put in through the F Scottish Funding Council, are an interesting experiment in that regard. I mean, I, my own university provides the base for two of them, which is one of them is stratified medicine and the other is senses and imaging. And... In stratified medicine, a lot of the initial spade work to try and translate this amazing research which is happening in Scotland has, requires public investment. There is no other way to do it because these are new techniques. There's no way in which uh, you're likely to get private money into that phase. Now, the whole idea of these innovation centres is that initial public investment creates a number of exemplars which hopefully will then lead to investment in jobs and, and, and growth. And there are different examples depending on the different innovation centres. So I think we need to, you know, there are no easy answers in this space because if there were, we would have discovered them by now. But I think we need to feed off the fact that Scotland's universities provide two-thirds of our R&D if you look at our total R&D figures. And in fact, as, 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 as it's, I think we're fourth in the OECD in terms of, as a percentage of GDP, the amount of R&D that comes out of the universities. And that's not reflected in business R&D, but we need to use that base. That's where we, I think that has to be the point of departure in order to grow it, because we have a fantastic asset. But we need to look at the interface between that and the business sector. Um, uh, you know, just going back to the R&D, I think uh, what we spoke of before is something that you, you do get more, you get higher levels of R&D in, in companies overseas, but there are different systems to support that R&D, which I would... I would put forward is why you get more R&D in there. Um, uh, but also in the innovation process, um, or, or, or in innovation, um, it's not just innovation about products or technologies. I think you have to look at innovation in processes, marketing, you know, and, and the, the softer areas like that where maybe there's not enough, there's, there's not enough attention just now. And one big difference um, between Scottish universities and Americans, you know, you mentioned Stanford. Stanford are an investor in our business, and I go and see them regularly. They have an endowment fund of something like over 20 billion um, that they invest from. And um, that's just not a, a luxury that Scottish universities have. So it's very difficult to compare the two. 
And, and I think what it does prove that when you invest in it, you when agree. you invest... The concept is right. I'm not yes. suggesting no, 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 we no, start no, with $20 billion, but no, no, the con we start it. It absolutely proves the co you know, what, that if you invest, you, you get better results. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, Patrick Harvey. Good morning. Um, I wanted to explore with you whether the Scottish Government's economic strategy has the context right. The, the first section on context um, begins, Scotland has strong economic foundations. And perhaps, understandably, there's a, an emphasis on the positive. Uh, I'm wondering whether the, the strategy uh, ought to have some greater recognition of the risks that the Scottish economy faces. Uh, do any of you have general comments about whether the strategy uh, properly assesses the risks that we may face in the future uh, and what those might be? Well, let me take a start. I mean, uh, from my reading of it, I thought that it, it did a reasonable job of balancing those things out. One, one of the things that we're trying to look at here is um, uh, that we've got in our remit, as you know, is, is how we deal with inclusive growth, for example. And one of the ways that we want to do that is to try and be mindful of the fact that there, are, there can be downsides to the way you put policies in place for, for things like that too. And so we need to find a balance that says, you know, how, do we, how are we mindful of uh, both the risks and opportunities in, in being able to drive in that particular direction? So I, I think in the, in the implementation of the general theme, there is a lot of attention being paid to trying to make sure that we understand exactly how much risk there is in, in what it is we're going to try to do. Uh, if, you, you may be right, it may not be spelled out enough in the, in the context of the document itself, but I think it was people were mindful of, of the risks as well. I've seen a number of people commenting that um, the combination of wealth and income inequality in the UK, uh, as well as the level of debt, UK government's focused on public debt, but the, the level of private debt is vastly bigger, uh, and the operation of the finance sector uh, indicate that the conditions could be right for another economic crash. Wealth and income inequality are addressed, uh, you're, you're quite right, but there's nothing at all about debt, nothing at all about how finance is operating, uh, and I'm wondering if uh, some greater recognition of what might be the risks of a, of a further crash or recession and what the necessity is for resilience in the face of that possibility. I think it's a really interesting question, and I think this is something that we might well discuss at the Council for Economic Advisers over the next two days. But what impressed me about the economic strategy was the fact that while we might not be have articulated all the risks that we might have done or it might have done, in actual fact, I think that in mitigating those risks, I think it did a very good job, because one way that we mitigate the risks, the future risks of, it, of an economy, is to include more people and more participation and greater growth. And I think the, the whole element of inclusive growth and actually goes some way to mitigate these risks. If we think it's already been mentioned that much of our um, business structure is made up of SMEs, one of the ways that we mitigate great risk in the economy is to actually have a, a, a more thriving, diversified SME sector. And that, to me, would be a very important way of mitigating the risks. I certainly agree with that, that latter point about diversification and uh, you know, small and medium businesses rather than the, the, the domination of a handful of multinationals in many sectors. Uh, I, I won't pursue the, the question about growth because uh, ideologically I bore my colleagues rigid on, on that question uh, quite frequently. One other risk that I would like to ask you about uh, relates to the speech that Mark Carney gave last week uh, about climate change. Um, Take, for example, he said, the IPCC's estimate of a carbon budget that would likely limit global temperature risks uh, rises to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, which you'll be aware is not a safe level, but regarded as a maximum tolerable level of, of, of damage. That budget amounts to between one-fifth and one-third of the world's proven reserves of oil, gas, and coal. If that estimate is even approximately correct, it would render the vast majority of reserves stranded oil, gas, and coal that would be literally unburnable without expensive carbon capture technology, which itself alters fossil fuel economics. He later says, a wholesale reassessment of prospects, especially if it were to occur suddenly, could potentially destabilize markets, 
spark a pro-cyclical crystallization of losses and a persistent tightening of fiscal conditions. He had me until pro-cyclical crystallization, but I, I'm assuming Mr. Carney thinks it would be bad. The Scottish government and its economic strategy seems to regard the oil and gas sector and its dominance in our economy only in positive terms, only as a positive value, not as a potential liability, not as a vulnerability. Doesn't that need to be broadened, uh, particularly in light of this argument that essentially fossil fuel divestment is no longer merely an ethical concern, but an economic one? I mean, the, the solutions to the problem you set out is, has to be a global one. It's not one that a small country can, can solve by itself. But you're absolutely right that clearly whatever measures are taken in, 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 in terms of global um, um, attempts to counter climate change would need to be factored into any country's economic strategy. But I think that the problem at the moment is that, you know, and, and I mean, I think the governor of the Bank of England was right to warn. I mean, it's one of those, uh, one of those, uh, one of those uh, unknowns but huge risks that the, the global economy faces. But I, you know, to be honest, it's difficult for for a small country to, in itself, do, um, you know, act unless you're looking at the overall global framework of how you would respond. To, to that. Certainly diversification, as you mentioned, is, is the right thing to do. Uh, but, you know, if, if you take this as the starting point, it's uh, in, in itself, it couldn't take any action which would make substantial difference to, 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 to the global climate change challenge. Could I just pick you up on that? In terms of climate change, our impact on the climate, that's quite right. It requires a global solution and every country has to be part of it. But in terms of the economic vulnerability from a carbon bubble, that is something which is relevant to the way a domestic economy operates. And Scotland's economy is more exposed than most to the overvaluation of an industry which is sitting on what will become stranded assets. And I think it's, it's something that needs to watch, just in the same way as you pointed out earlier, that the whole world is still in a very delicate condition in terms of, of the financial situation. Again, that's something which we don't control. But Jose Vinales was from the IMF, which is pointing out that, you know, whilst many OECD countries have taken action to, to shore up their banking sector, um, the same hasn't happened in many emerging markets. Now, all you need is another shock to that, and then that puts us all in, in a very difficult position, just to come back to the earlier question you asked. So I, I see it in a very similar light. Absolutely, we need to build resilience. We need to look at diversification. Um, but, you know, I, I think we are where we are in terms of how this economy has, has developed. And, and yes, we, we need to become more resilient, absolutely. I would, I would certainly agree with that. Did Professor Carter want to come back in? No, I completely agree with uh, Professor Muscatelli's comments here. Um, one of the great attractions, um, I think, of this new economic strategy is, is, is the focus on SMEs and inclusive growth. Um, the participation, for example, of women and also um, eth our ethnic minorities, our BME, and our refugee populations. It's important not only economically, but it's also important in, in terms of social integration as well. And th those are also other risks that, that, that have to be considered. So for me, I, 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 I support everything that Muscatelli's uh, suggested and, uh, uh, and in really echo the focus on SMEs. Lewis McDonald wants to come in. Yeah. Following up on that and Master Catelli's, uh, agreement with Patrick Harvey's line of questioning around carbon and hydrocarbons, if, if, if indeed you, you, you do take the view that resilience and diversification are, are urgent, and Jim McCall talked about the short-term impact of the current oil and gas downturn, will you offer advice to the government about how it responds to the current oil and gas downturn, or will you wait to be asked? I mean, we, as you know, we respond to what the First Minister asks us to, to give advice on. So far, we have not been asked around this area, but we stand ready to help in any way we can. We've, I think we've just heard from one of your colleagues uh, yep. our, our recognition of the seriousness yep. of this. Do you, do you have no mechanism for drawing issues to the attention? Absolutely not. We, we can, as we start the meeting, uh, we start the meeting today at one uh, fifteen. We can certainly uh, bring that to attention. Say it was one of the big issues from the, the council, from the uh, conveners here. And, uh, one of the areas that um, the government are looking at is um, trying to get more industrial manufacturing, grow that sector. You know, and I think that's what you need to do. We're too dependent on construction. 
uh, oil and gas and financial services. You know, we need to grow other sectors, and there's definitely a, a focus from uh, from them on growing the manufacturing sector as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Joanne Lovett. Can I maybe just ask a process, following on from what Louise McDonald said, a process question. You're a Council of Economic Advisors, but you don't actively offer advice. You wait to be asked. Is that right? Well, it's not, it's not so much. The, 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 in every council we've had, from the first one <coughs> when it was set up in 2008, the First Minister has said, here are the things that I would like your advice on. It doesn't mean that we can't go back, and, as I will today, and say that, we, that from this committee there were some issues raised that we think you might want to consider uh, having us take a look at. When, but when generally speaking, we respond to what the First Minister so wants to do. When the Scottish Government revised its economic strategy, it didn't test that against its independent advisers. It published it, and you have made some comments on it, but you hadn't a role at any point to say, well, we maybe wouldn't do this, or maybe the, the consequence of that, that didn't happen. Well, Which we, is we actually had uh, a process last year where... Um, and in the previous council where we actually met the night before without any government people there to discuss things that we thought were important to raise. So um, um, there were a number of things come out of that yeah. uh, that we did raise. You know, it uh, wasn't always accepted, but um, <laughs> we... we <laughs> I think that's a whole set of questions in its own. But So the Scottish Government can establish a new economic strategy with a nuanced approach on, on taxation, as opposed to a very, very clear position on taxation, without it testing that against your views? Well, it would have pre-tested it, is the, is the issue. I mean, we, we, most of the things that are in the economic strategy we talked at about at some point during the, the work of the Council. Uh, but I, I think it would be unreasonable for us to ask the government to run it by us and say, can, we, can you approve, review? I mean, they, they've got to go do their own thing with that. All we can do is uh, talk to them in advance about, uh, about those areas where we, we thought we had competence. But there were indiv individual uh, phone calls, I think, with some yeah. of the economists and so on, uh, you know, just to, to bounce things off them. To, it's clearly to the role and job of government to develop an economic strategy. It's just whether... There's a transparent process by which they test their decisions against their own economic advisers or not. I mean, that, and that's obviously not your responsibility. Can I ask on specifically round? I take from what you're, you're saying that you do support the notion of inclusive growth, and my understanding of that is that in growth you ensure um, job creation, good quality jobs, perhaps, and also that people have access to them who are further away from the jobs market. If that is the case. Do you think that you would, would it be worth your while exploring, reviewing, for example, the role of Scottish Enterprise, which moved from having responsibility for people in place to simply looking, and it, you know, there's an argument for it, these are the growth sectors we want to see um, investment in. Do you think if Scottish Enterprise is part of um, strategy for uh, inclusive growth, they should have a responsibility for identifying groups of people who are far away from the market or um, areas where you could ensure that there is access to good quality jobs? My, my understanding is that they, they, they do have a remit around the inclusive growth piece, I mean, both in terms of you know, the bringing um, more people into the workforce, uh, but also in terms of geography, because we want it to be inclusive by geography. We don't want all the jobs to turn up in the, in the central belt of Scotland and for the rest of the country to be just ignored. And I know they're working very hard in the geographical aspect of, uh, of what they're trying to do in that regard. May I answer? I, I, I think that Scottish Enterprise has in the past focused mainly and possibly quite rightly, on its account-managed companies, these companies that have met a certain threshold of business growth, that have the potential to grow further, to innovate, and to internationalise their offering. And I think that that's quite appropriate. I think where the issue around inclusive growth is concerned is that when we look at the companies and the people who run those companies, it didn't seem to be reflective totally of all parts of the economy and, 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 and left some people excluded. I think that's an economic risk, if you like, because by excluding these people or their non-participation of people and sectors and geographies, I think that Scotland loses out. Um, my understanding is that Scottish Enterprise have 
embraced the notion of inclusive growth, do not see it as being in any way conflicting with economic growth, but it's actually the two pillars on which this economy will grow. And because of that, I think we've seen uh, a greater involvement of people who perhaps haven't been supported by Scottish Enterprise uh, are now being uh, included in the economic agenda too. I, th I think the, you know, the, this is a, a bigger issue for um, the, the welfare side and uh, skills development Scotland are, are a devolved issue but um, Job Centre Plus and so on is reserved and they're not they're not tied up um, you know and, and it's more about um, I think this is m more to do with government policy than than Scottish enterprise I think they would they would contribute most by helping more companies to internationalize their business and grow their business um, you know, there are things like equality of opportunity. There are people at the bottom end coming out of school who are not who who are not given equality of opportunity. They've got challenges that aren't met just now, and we need to support these people to get them into a good job. There's also the wages. I mean, I, I don't think the government should be subsidising low pay. Um, with um, employers should be paying enough for people to live on, not having to get through tax credits and um, support uh, to subsidise low pay in companies. So there's, there's a whole issue, a, a whole load of things there that need to change that I think is um, not a, a Scottish, uh, Scottish enterprise issue. I think also an important point is that the strategy is a framework with these two pillars and, and the, and the cross-cutting themes. But, um, the concept of inclusive growth, which is a relatively recent one, which the OECD and other agencies, have, international agencies have embraced, are about trying to construct a framework which tries to measure how you would, you know, how you're progressing against an agenda of inclusive growth. So you would, you would come up with a number of indicators which would give you multi-dimensional aspects of living standards. So it's not just about the economy, it's about health, it's about other dimensions. So, I mean, the way I would see this uh, emerging, I imagine, is that we will provide government advice, the government will come up with a more granular way of measuring progress against, uh, uh, against these, these aspects of, of inclusive growth, and then you would f see that filtering through uh, government agencies, including SE and, and others. So, you know, I think, uh, I think the strategy provides a framework. But clearly where we can provide advice is in looking at what is international best practice in terms of developing the, the, the sort of more granular aspect, how you measure inclusive growth, how different measures impact on different indicators, and therefore uh, the set of policy choices which the government then has. But, I mean, I don't think the whole job is Scottish Enterprise, clearly. However, Scottish Enterprise, out of its budget, has just left 10% for inclusive growth. How can that possibly be a twin strategy? if most of their work is focused on identifying investment opportunities in f the key sectors. We all know that it's possible to grow the economy and leave some people as far away from the job market and being involved as if you have a, you know, a low-growth economy. So would you say, in your advice, if Scottish Enterprise is in favour of a twin track, is it acceptable for them simply to use 10% of their budgets on it? If they asked your advice, what would you say? You're qualified to figure out, you know, what, how the Scottish Enterprise people should spend their budget. But I, you know, I, I mean, we have to. They, they 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 know that this is an important part of the government's economic strategy. I assume that they have taken pains to make sure that they are spending enough to be able to do what they can do with it. And the track approach, which is different from the old approach, includes inclusive growth. Um, it looks like a fair split for you for the Scottish Enterprise only to be split. If you were asked, 10% would, would, would cover it. It doesn't feel as if it's talking about identifying economic and social risk and shifting to geography and communities and groups who are excluded. It feels as if it's largely the same as before, but 10% budget is really very small, surely. Personally, I would support a, a further focus on inclusive growth. Do so you think the Scottish Government uh, in all of its agencies. I mean, I, I do think that one of your jobs surely must be to lift the, the strategy off the paper and say these things need to happen in order for it to, to actually be inclusive growth. 
Well, I think as Professor Moscatel has described, this is a framework where asked for advice, uh, and we will give that advice to the best of our ability based on our expertise. Um, maybe this will come up in discussions in the next couple of days. And I think also another important element is that where we've seen around the, the, the world in other countries attempts to put in policies for inclusive growth, these are not simply exercised by government through single policies, either in tax or benefits. It's about joining up different agencies and making them work better together. So I, it's difficult for me to answer your question about SE, partly because I'd need to look at the detail of how that, inter those, that, that spend, that 10% spend, interfaces with other elements of spend across, across uh, government. No doubt that will be part of our discussions. I, I, I be at 2.30 today, it's part of our discussions. So, um, uh, and governments everywhere are feeling their way through this, right? I mean, the, the OECD, for example, is, uh, sees Scotland as, as an incubator for the in inclusive growth area. They, they think the things we are starting on are correct, but nobody has all the right answers here. And never, uh, lots of countries are trying to tackle this at the same time. We're learning from each other about what you can spend and what you can't spend, what differences you can make. It's going to take some time to do this. Do you have a role in, a, in scrutinising other organisations that be part of inclusive growth around education, for example? I mean, if somebody's leaving school without the basic skills, further education becomes critically important, skills development in Scotland becomes critically important. Will you be looking at their budgets and the emphasis within Scottish government budgets on being inclusive around development of skills in order to deliver an inclusive growth strategy? If I can give my personal opinion, which is um, simply on, on simply things I've said already in, in public on, on inequality, there's absolutely no doubt that one of the biggest um, positive impacts on reducing inequality is investment in early years education. So, you know, if you look at all the evidence around the world, it's, it's, it's about bedding that in through early years education, childcare, these are sort of policies which take a long time to have impact. Let's, let's, not, let's, let, let's not pretend they're going to solve things immediately. But these are exactly the sort of things that could have a transformative effect on, on, on employment and growth in the long run. That's what we've seen certainly from Scandinavia, from another other, uh, other European countries. So that's a personal view which I will certainly be articulating in any engagement I had on, on inclusive growth with, with, with the government. And as you say also, further on, trying to match skills properly to the need of, of the economy is another important element. But personally, you know, we know from most economic evidence the biggest bang for your buck comes from investment in the very early years. Although also investing in the parents who bring in, who are supporting their children. So yes. second chance education, yes. you could argue, is absolutely critical as well. So we, we don't want to write off a whole generation who didn't get that benefit at the early stages. Indeed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm conscious we've been running for an hour, but two members still want to come in. Um, first of all, Lewis MacDonald. Thanks very much. You, you'll be aware that uh, Scotland's devolved government is moving into a whole new phase over the next uh, few months and, and, and over the next couple of years in terms of fiscal devolution, in terms of our responsibility for setting tax rates, but also opportunities for borrowing the creation of a new fiscal framework and so on. Part of the structure around that is, is a fiscal commission. Uh, but I'd be interested in your views and what advice you might offer to ministers about a couple of aspects of the proposed fiscal commission as it currently stands. One of those is its ability to initiate its own economic forecast and fiscal forecasts, and the other is the independence of the commission. I wonder if you have uh, either individually or collectively taken a view on these two too important. Uh, well, let me I'll start and maybe Anton might want to come in. But uh, So uh, the Fiscal Commission was something that grew out of the Fiscal Commission working group that we had as a part of the prior council. And I would say on, uh, if you look at what Fiscal Commissions do throughout the rest of the developed world, which we did uh, at the time, uh, some of, most of them have some degree of independence, uh, ideally total independence, which is, I think, where, where we would have come down on this thing. And most of them also uh, take an independent view of the, of the economy and where it's going. And those were a couple of the pillars on which we, we had built that. But the, there is a, there are, it, it, and I'm sure you can, it will be available on, the, on our uh, website, but the, there was a wide range of views in there taken by governments throughout the world in terms of when they set up their own fiscal commissions. But certainly uh, the side that we came down on in the Fiscal Commission Working Group was for both independence and for independent uh, review of, uh, of fiscal affairs. 
that, that, that's very helpful. You'll, you'll, you'll be aware of the views of a number of bodies. The Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland is uh, the one that I have in front of me at the moment, saying that uh, the way that the Fiscal Commission is proposed to be set up at the moment does not have the appearance of independence uh, because it's being set up within the Scottish administration <coughs> that will provide reports and accounts at the request of ministers uh, and uh, the uh, functions of the Fiscal Commission can be changed by statutory instrument. Do you, in that respect, w agree with the suggestion by them and other bodies that this uh, proposal falls short of the level of independence that you advised was was the best way forward. You know, I haven't, I, to be fair, I haven't read what the, what the accountants have been saying about this, but I, I think the, the more independent we can make these things, uh, obviously the better uh, experience, again, from around the globe seem to tell us that the quality of the people that you put onto it helped dramatically. And uh, if you, uh, even if it was within governments, but there were strong-minded, uh, competent people uh, running things, that you would be likely to get a reasonably independent view. Again, it's clear from the uh, draft uh, of what is proposed at the moment that the Fiscal Commission will be asked to comment on the government's forecasts, but will not be uh, empowered to make forecasts of its own. Do you think that, again, that is different from what your conclusion is? I'd like are? to second-guess the government on this one. I think they, they need to make their own decision about to where it comes across. We certainly give them a wide range of, uh, of uh, uh, views about how different Fiscal Commissions work. I think it's for them now to take that forward in the way they think will work best. The, 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 the final point I, I would like to ask was um, closer to home, I guess, the Royal Academy in their evidence to the Finance Committee uh, said that the Commission's independence, the Fiscal Commission's independence, uh, would be strengthened by ensuring that a Commissioner may not at the same time serve as a member of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers. Um, does that seem to you sensible, given uh, that... We discussed that at some length yep. in, in the Council, and that was what we thought too. Thank you very much. Just, I mean, just, just as a slightly tangential issue to that line of questioning, I think we're, we are entering an interesting time in Scotland where you know, we'll have much more fiscal power devolved and the Scottish Government will have many more levers at its disposal in terms of the economy. How well served do you think we are in terms of um, objective economic uh, analysis of government decisions? I'm not thinking about the Fiscal Commission specifically. I'm thinking about in terms of the academic world, for example. Do we need, do we need more think tanks who are going to advise government on, uh, on, on test government policies and proposals? I, I think you'll find that there will be much more interest by think, existing think tanks and, and existing academics as well. I think it's interesting that um, IPPR, for instance, has set up a base in Scotland. I think that you'll find existing think tanks like IFS probably spending more resources on this. I think as devolution progresses, uh, uh, I think there's no doubt in my mind that economists independent academic economists will find this a really interesting thing to, to, to analyze. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether that, you know, I, I personally do think that in the past Scotland perhaps hasn't had its fair share of, uh, of think tanks. Uh, partly a lot of them have been London-centric and, and have tended to pay too much attention perhaps to, 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 uh, to national as opposed to what's happening either at uh, a country level or, or regional level. But I have no doubt that there will be a response to this because these are int really interesting times, as you say. Okay. So if you knew of any wealthy entrepreneurs who might want to fund think tanks who uh, might do this work, you might suggest their names to us. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Chick Brewery. Yes. <coughs> yeah, good question. Um, we, we've dwelt on oil um, earlier today and the impact on the Scottish economy. And, and while I have... Um, you know, a lot of sympathy with my colleague Patrick Harvey's view on the impact of, of oil. Of course, it's a major ingredient in many of uh, products involved in medicine and what have you. Uh, and I've just spent three and a half years doing a project on trying to get the UK government to look at oil and gas in the Clyde and the Atlantic margins. And that's now progressing. But one thing that we don't, haven't done is look at the rare earths that are available in Scotland. I just really want you ask you to try and get this on the agenda. Northern Ireland ran uh, <coughs> what they called the TELUS project in 2005 uh, to look at the geological uh, impact or, or, or assets of, of Northern Ireland. They spent six and a half million pounds doing that project and when they found out what was there they issued licenses for exploration to the tune of 37 million pounds and now they have are developing 
uh, exploration for uh, gold, silver and cobalt. The geological structure, of course, runs across into Scotland. And in fact, we have just helped uh, uh, some guys introduce them to entrepreneurs to get uh, funding to license drilling for gold, silver and cobalt in, in uh, the southwest. I can't say where because I've signed a confidentiality agreement, but uh, I do have a rock with some gold in, it, in my office. Can I ask that, you know, when we look at the assets of Scotland, that we try and encourage uh, at some stage an investigation into, particularly given the global uh, situation regarding rare earths, that we at least get some idea uh, the benefits and the assets that Scotland has in terms of the rare earths that uh, are below our feet. I would never have thought of it, but I'll, I'll raise that also. Thank you. If you do, I'll tell you where the gold is. <laughs> <laughs> gold rush, right. Okay, good. Well, I think that's the end of our questioning. Um, can I, on behalf of the committee, thank uh, all uh, the witnesses for coming along today and giving us an insight into the work of the Council for Economic Advisors. And I think we do very much appreciate the input, and I hope we can repeat this session at some future point, perhaps with the, the new committee in the new parliament. Um, just before we suspend and go into private session, I'd just like to mention to committee members that uh, this is uh, our committee assistant, Lindsay's uh, last meeting with us. Lindsay is moving on to do, uh, moving on to the presiding officer's office. So this will be our last uh, meeting and we wish you well, Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, and at that, we'll suspend. Thank you.